Hey everyone, I'm John Negroni, film editor for theyoungfolks.com. I'm also the host of the Cinemaholics podcast, where I usually review films in a little bit more detail with my co-host, Will Ashen of Cinema Blend, so definitely check that out if you're interested in other reviews that I do. And I'm back here again for a review of a new film, a highly anticipated film for me, called Licorice Pizza. So Licorice Pizza, it's the latest film from Paul Thomas Anderson, who is one of the most critically acclaimed directors of the modern film era, of the directors working today. If there's any director still making films right now who will be known as having one of the all-time great filmographies ever, then I would personally put PTA at the very top of that list. Because, I mean, out of his nine films, I count only one of those as being disappointing or a bit of a disappointment with audiences and critics, at least when it initially came out, and that's Inherent Vice. I know Inherent Vice has its fans, and I think, interestingly so, it's a film that I didn't really connect with, but I've heard that when you rewatch it, it gets a little bit better and a little bit better, so that might be the case for some. And that said, I mean, if Inherent Vice is considered your weakest film, that's a very nice problem to have if you're a director, honestly. So anyway, Licorice Pizza, it takes place in early 70s Los Angeles. I think it's supposed to be about 1973 or so, and not just Los Angeles, but specifically the Valley. So Encino, Sherman Oaks. It follows two young people, a 15-year-old child actor named Gary, who's trying to figure out the next stage of his career. He's played by Cooper Hoffman, the son of the late Philip Seymour Hoffman, of course, who worked with PTA and films like The Master. And the film also is about a 25-year-old woman working as a photographer's assistant. Her name is Alana, and she's played by Alana Heim, whose real-life band has actually collaborated with PTA in the past. You might have heard of Heim before. Actually, her two older sisters from the band even make an appearance in the film as well. Now, Gary immediately pursues Alana romantically, even though she points out the obvious that he's 15 and she's 25, she's way too old for him and it would be illegal. (laughs) Nevertheless, the two of them become inseparable platonic friends and they embark on a variety of schemes. One of them includes a waterbed business that puts them in the crosshairs of the infamously eccentric John Peters. Loved seeing him here, played pretty memorably by Bradley Cooper, actually. And at one point, Alana sort of whims herself into politics. She volunteers for a local mayoral candidate, played by Benny Softy. There's a lot of directions this film goes in. I've just laid out a couple. And like most of PTA's movies, Licorice Pizza is very long, and it often comes off a bit as meandering. We kind of go from place to place and character to character, seemingly without purpose or a traditional story structure. We always know it's about these two kids. And yeah, I mean, the film usually, if any film, has three acts and a climax. This movie does have three acts and a climax, but it's PTA's version. He's doing his usual oddball thing where anything goes, you never know quite what to expect. One of my favorite things about Licorice Pizza is how it feels to me like a really good amalgamation of some of PTA's best films. It has the quirky charm of 70s LA, like in Boogie Nights, but it also has the delightful unpredictability I was talking about of LA in Magnolia. And side note, as somebody who's never been a fan of LA, I personally, I just, when every time I go to LA, I don't mind visiting, but to me, there's always this desperation in the air. There's there's an energy that I just don't vibe with. It's a big reason why I, I live in California. I live in the Bay Area and I love California, but LA has just never been my place. At the same time, Licorice Pizza kind of gets somebody like me who's kind of anti-LA to a point. Um, it gets me to kind of understand a little bit of the appeal, actually, and, and even kind of sympathize with it, which is very impressive because normally when I watch movies about LA, I get a little bit like, uh, glad I don't live there. Uh, it's not my place, but if you love LA, I'm not judging. Now, we don't really have the epic gravitas of some of PTA's other films, like There Will Be Blood. Uh, we don't have like a blood curdling performances like we do in the master although these two you know hoffman and heim are wonderful but yeah it's not philip seymour hoffman and joaquin phoenix but one thing licorice pizza has that we haven't really gotten from pta in quite a while is a really good sense of humor and seemingly seemingly endless heart phantom thread had some humor but not like this this is very different pta's films 
in my opinion, have, have always been about how human beings are inherently unbelievably complex. Human beings are the worst. They're so complicated, usually in a bad way. But if you show people a little patience and understanding, they can really surprise you. That tends to be the common thesis in his movies, even his most cynical ones. His previous film, Phantom Thread, it was I thought it was brilliant in portraying the complexity of a person through an unconventional romance. And I think he's done it again and arguably better with Licorice Pizza. Although Licorice Pizza has two major problems that might give some people pause. So I'm going to get those out of the way here. Because if you take these problems and if, if they weren't there, I could see this being an even better movie. Although, let's talk about it. So the first one is probably indefensible. Now, like I said, this is a very funny movie throughout. There are a handful of scenes, however, that depict Asian caricatures through the mouth of John Michael Higgins. The wonderful John Michael Higgins, by the way. And I just found it deeply uncomfortable and kind of pointless. It's one of those jokes that doesn't really make sense. Like if you ask the simple question, well, what is the joke? And maybe PTA finds it hilarious to point out how utterly offensive this man, John Michael Higgins character is without he even realizing it. But if that's the case, I don't know. I don't think that's a very good joke. And at the very least, I don't think it's funny enough to justify its inclusion and the inclusion of it and how it's going to really make a lot of people uncomfortable, uh, especially uncomfortable if other people laugh with the caricature instead of at the character in the, th in the theater, if that makes sense. And I think it's an unforced error considering the film. Otherwise, I mean, it lands all of its other punchlines. I thought that was like the one time and they, they do it a couple of times, which is really annoying. Um, yeah, it's unfortunate. The second issue and this is one I'm still chewing on. And I actually don't think like you could just take this out of the movie. I actually kind of think you have a totally different movie if you don't have this. And that's the central concept of a romance between a 15 year old and a 25 year old. Like I said, they're platonic throughout the movie, but really that is like the heart of this is like he wants to be with her and she won't be with him. Um, on paper, it looks bad. And I've gone back and forth multiple times on what to make of PTA's logic with this as his story. To be clear, the entire film is about how there is an immediate chemistry between Alana and Gary. But the problem is the age difference, at least at first. And as they move on to other romantic prospects, they can't quite quit each other and they're unable to process what to do about their jealousy. They go together about as well as licorice and pizza. Nevertheless, they want to be licorice pizza. That's at least my take on the title of the film. It's perfectly possible that it's just called that because it's just called that, but that, that was my takeaway. Now you could say that if the genders were reversed, if this was a 25 year old man and a 15 year old girl, we'd be in like Woody Allen territory, right? I mean, we would be, we would have a film here that I think would be immediately rejected for good reason, because I think what's inherently bad about that is the power imbalance. But the thing with this movie is, well, the genders aren't reversed. And I think there is something compelling here about, like I said, the power and balance between an adult and a teenager. Both of these characters, the adult and the teenager, they're on the fringes of their respective age groups. Gary is somebody who's grown up too quickly, and Alana is somebody who doesn't know when she's going to grow up and really reach that stage of adulthood where she wants to be. So even though Alana is older, she actually works for Gary. And the film even sort of jokes about how his mother works for him too. So you have an Oedipus thing going on there as well. So it's almost like I think PTA is trying to point out the absurdity of this larger than life teenage boy who's coming out coming of age at the same time and in the same way as a 25 year old woman. Both of them are completely different in their approaches to life and love, yet they're still fully entranced by the other person. So again, I think if you took that out of the movie, like if you made him 18 and you made her 28, I don't think the movie still works as I think he intended. And you can dislike that and reject the film anyway. I understand, but I think for me, I'm kind of, I love the risk of it. I, I do. I, I feel bad about that, but I do. I, I think that it's a big swing and I appreciate that PTA is going for it. Um, I imagine most people 
won't even care about this age difference because the actors are just that good. It's truly amazing that this is both of their first films. And I think a lot can be said and will be about Hoffman's performance here, his persona as an overconfident showman who knows exactly when to reveal the cracks of his facade that he's trying to pull. And he knows just when to be vulnerable at just the right time. It really does remind me of his dad, but it's also his own thing. Like he's not just in his dad's shadow. And yeah, let it be said that PTA continues to be just a master at directing his actors, regardless of whether or not you like the overall film. I think yeah when it comes to cinematography directing and acting his films just always hit the mark there with alana heim you have a character i think we've seen a character like this in a lot of other movies which could be annoying right but it really comes down to how she plays it she's playing a self-assured woman who can never seem to catch a break but she tries anyway and yeah, I think I think it comes down to how Heim plays this really close to her heart. Like you're seeing her instead of the performance. You know, it, it kind of, and I, I don't say this lightly, it, it feels like you're watching a movie for the first time, just in general. And I think she's a big part of that. And, and that's really, I want to say, what Licorice Pizza does best. Despite its length, it's over two hours long, it flies by because it immediately whisks you into a dream state like no other. You can surely come out of this movie with hours of conversation and dissection over what was good, what was bad, what was genius, what was dumb. (laughs) But the very existence of this movie, I think, is the best thing about it. And even the flaws kind of just, they feel like the point almost. So needless to say, I fell in love with Licorice Pizza, and like with most of PTA's other films, I imagine it's one of those things where repeated viewings are going to be even more rewarding, because his films always are like that in any respect. If you've ever disliked one of his movies, I challenge you to give it another shot. I've always found that the second, third, and fourth time, it's like once you get to the third viewing, there's just something about his movies that they just get better and better. At least for me, and I've noticed that's been the case with other people as well. So yeah, just when you think that PTA has run out of ingredients and stories that he can tell, he surprises us with something entirely new and impossible to forget. So I'm so happy that this movie exists and that it came out this year because it's really, really great. I want to do uh, a new little section here because I, I've I've had some people say like, oh, you didn't talk about this, you didn't talk about this. And usually it's because when you're doing like reviews and everything, it's like, it's hard to talk about everything organically. So this is called extra credits. So I'm just going to like do a bunch of the stuff that I didn't get to uh, real quick. Right. I used to do this for my old reviews back in the day, like back when I was first writing reviews, like 10 years ago, I was, you know, doing extra credits at the very end of like, oh yeah, I didn't talk about that. I didn't talk about that. So I'm going to do that here. Uh, so first of all, okay. This movie cost $40 million to make. And it is a paradox because on the one hand, I think it looks like it has a $40 million budget, but also it doesn't. Like it doesn't look like that in a way that's not flashy, if that makes sense. But you can tell they put so much effort into the craft of this thing. And on that note, I got to mention PTA has a co-cinematographer credit on this, which I don't, I don't remember for sure if he usually gets that in other films, like officially. It's always rumored that like he does a lot of the cinematography himself, but he doesn't always get credit. I could be totally wrong about that. But yeah, for this movie, he worked with Michael Bowman and yeah, they truly brought like 70s LA to life in a way that wasn't just authentic, but really very much its own like living, breathing world with its own rules and design language. It kind of reminded me of mid nineties in that respect. I don't know if any of you like that film. Uh, Okay, so next thing. I avoided talking about a lot of these side characters because I'd hate to rob the surprise. I went into this not watching the trailer and I didn't know who was in it. Like I didn't know that, I didn't even know Cooper Hoffman was in this. I didn't know that this was Heim, you know? I just watched the movie. And I think that's the fun of like, oh my gosh, this person is in the movie as well. I feel bad that I mentioned the ones that I did mention, but needless to say, everyone in this is brilliant. They make an instant impression. And I really want to specifically call out the younger actors who pal around with Gary. They're really great. I, th- I thought they were all really fun. And uh, I, I was glad that they, they got their little shout out. Uh, on that note, actually, the, the throwback credit sequence they did for this is really fun. So at the end, this is the end of the movie. They give every character, almost every character, a shout out, which was great. Uh, the score is the last thing I'll say. The score is by Johnny Greenwood. 
I think it's magnificent. It's purposefully understated. So it's yeah, it's not as bombastic and notable as like Phantom Thread and There Will Be Blood. He did the scores for those, of course. But and and I got to say this too. I I honestly prefer the score Greenwood did for Spencer, uh, the Pablo Lorraine film that I talked about on, uh, not too long ago. Uh, I think that's a better score in terms of like. I liked it more and I thought it served the story a little bit more, but there's nothing to complain about with the score in this. I just think it's not one of the driving forces of the movie. So yeah, it's one of the reasons I didn't mention it during the meat of the review. But yeah, that's extra credits. Licorice Pizza opens in select theaters on November 26th. And so that's next week, obviously. And then it's going to go wide on December 25th for the holidays. So clearly it's a big awards contender. I hope this thing gets nominated for Best Picture. I think it has a decent shot of getting nominated. I'm kind of looking at the Best Picture frontrunners right now. And this looks like one of those films that's going to kind of be talked about in the same world as The Power of the Dog in terms of like, this is the movie that like film critics and cinephiles are kind of like going to hold kind of to similar esteem while other people are talking about King Richard and Belfast. I think industry folks will be all in for Belfast. You know, mainstream audiences are going to be all in for King Richard probably. And yeah, film critics and cinephiles will probably be divided on licorice pizza and power of the dog. I'm not sure how all that's going to shape out. It could be totally different for all I know. I'm not an awards person, really. I am just a spectator like the rest of you. But yeah, that's all I have for Licorice Pizza. Thank you for watching this. And yeah, I'm going to be talking about Red Rocket soon, which I really, really can't wait to talk about. And House of Gucci. Going to talk about House of Gucci. Can't put it off forever. So until then, I'll see you all next time.